questions directly. So uh, we're going to move on to our next section. In our next session, section, we talk about something that's very, very common to, to us, and that's community. And so, Betty, you, you were talking about, in the, in the introduction, you were talking about all the things and all the places that we can get tested. Uh, so um, I'm going to ask the question, what is MDH's focus on reducing the impact of COVID-19 in the Black community? What specifically is a MDH doing to target the Black community, to put out messaging, to just reach the Black community? Okay. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Okay. Well, what MDH has been doing is we've been really focusing on the messaging and getting the messaging out to the African-American community, but not only the African-American community, to all of the communities. We've been issuing guidance and we've been... Uh, Every week we send messaging on whatever the community say that they're needing the messaging on. I think I talked about from the very beginning, the social distances and the guidance, and we're giving them resources on where they can go and find um, out whether it's, um, we, we did some psychological um, messaging around, uh, at one time it was really talking about how staying home people that uh, suffer from domestic violence and sexual violence uh, being in the home with the perpetrator on a, a more, more, more often than they would when they were in school or other places, you know, since we're social distancing. And so we put some guidance out on how to uh, protect yourself that way and had a suicide hotline. We have also, as I said, continually put the messaging out each week on how to do these things from grocery shopping. We, we just had so many guidance opening the churches. You know, that was a really big lift to get them to close the churches because in the African-American community, our faith is all we got. You know, and uh, Barano, you said earlier that you were the only transplant, but I want you to know that you're not the only transplant because I was born and raised in Arkansas and I am a product of the Jim Crow South. And so when we're talking about racism, I know racism when I see it. I know it when I feel it. And you can't dress it up. You can't put lipstick on a pig for me. And I still not recognize what racism is. And yes, it is very dominant in all of the institutions of well-being, whether it's education, jobs, housing, criminal justice. You know, uh, George Floyd was the third pandemic for me uh, as we were talking about COVID being the first pandemic and uh, the African-American being so affected by it and, and, and trying to make sure that they get the resources that they need to um, and get the message to know that this is serious and protect themselves and grandma and grandpa because they're the ones that was dying even when young kids don't think that they, they're contracted, you may have and taken it home. And so it was very important to get the messaging out to the African-American community also in the African-American community, we saw lots of folks that were still gathering and, and having barbecues and different things. And so we had to try and figure out how to get the message to these folks that this is really, really serious. And so I say to the public health officials that if you want people to think that something is serious, you need to show them something different. And when we were walking around in our communities and we didn't see masks, we don't see hand sanitizers. If you want people to wash their hands, put those products out there where, where they're available to them in the community. When they come out of a store, there should be a hand sanitizer station somewhere within a few blocks where they could wash their hands before they go to the next place or whatever. And so it's those kind of things that we're, we're looking for doing in the African-American community. I th think we have to be very, very careful and intentional about making sure that the African-American community has what they need because it is a public health crisis. And, and uh, racism is a public health crisis. It's nothing new to us as African-Americans because we've lived it all our lives. And so when we talk about all of those other conditions, you know, why did uh, it affect our community more? Dr. McKinney's right, because we are the essential workers. We're out there, we're driving the bus, we're in the grocery stores, the jobs, we're nurses, we're, we're CNAs, we're housekeepers. All those jobs that we were trained and indoctrined to when we were younger that you should be public servants. And, and so when we grew up, what do you want to be? You want to be a nurse, you want to be a doctor, you want to be a firefighter. And all those are essential jobs. And those are the jobs that we hold. And that's why we've been exposed more. And we weren't able to go in the house and sit down like everybody else because we were the essential workers. 
And so that's why I think that you see the exposure more in the African-American community, which is why we have to really make sure that we stress to the African-American community how important this is and we have to put the resources in place for our African-American community so that they can, uh, uh, com you know, just uh, stop the spread of COVID in our community, not just our community, but all communities. Because one thing COVID has did, it did show us that we, we were all connected, you know, and, and I, I saw a little meme that was said, we're all in the same storm, but we're not in the same boat. And when I see that, it's like some of us are in those little fisher boats, little canoes and stuff that you got to roll and paddle yourself. And then some folks are in yachts. And so, they, of course, they're going to be better in this storm than those of us that's in that canoe. So I just want to share that little uh, graphic to, to let us know how important it is that we really do have to put resources out there for the African-American community to help us because we are all connected. And if we perish, we all perish. I'm, I'm going to use that one, Daddy. I'm going to use that analogy. <laughs> uh, uh, that was a good one. I'm going to use that. Um, you reminded me, um, thank you for saying that you're not the only transplant. And you reminded, you reminded me of a scene that I was looking at on television uh, on the news about the protest and, you know, people were getting escort, escorted away. And then the news people, of course, had the mic in the face of the protesters and things like that. And one, one gentleman in, in Atlanta, he said, as he was uh, being escorted off by police, he said, Minnesota, I'm from Atlanta, but I got you. I got you. We we down for you here, and that's what it feels like. I'm a transplant, yes, but um, and I'm from New Orleans, where you know we don't we don't care about protesting and whatever. We'll do it at a drop of a dime. We'll we'll call out somebody and on their racist stuff, and the racists will stand there toe to toe with us and tell us why they don't want us to come in the store. It's right in your face. So we we don't have any problem with calling that out. Uh, we got here in Minnesota, and it's all around, but nobody's calling it out. And so now we have to do things quite differently. And so I want to let Minnesota know, I got you. I, I got you. So when we have things that we need to, uh, it needs to rise to the attention, and it needs to be presented, and it needs to say we need to restructure this, I got you. And I will say that if you can't, and if you're not accustomed to doing that that way. But Minnesota has shown that, wow, you started a whole world movement here in Minnesota. So we, we are able to do something. And we're not only able to do it for our community, but we're able to do it for all communities. This next uh, question are, um, is for Devin, Devin Gilchrist. Hi, Devin. Um, how will, and, and it says, how will the agency ensure that the voices of the community are heard, since we're talking about community here, uh, through purposeful, equitable, and targeted inclusion by ensuring that representatives, including DHS uh, state employees and non-employees from the community, are not an afterthought and purposefully welcomed and valued in the spaces and places where decisions are made. And so I think what you're, you're uh, hinting at it's called social equity, where we're getting the information from the community. We're working with community on solving some of our own solutions and problems as state employees and as community members. So, Devin, have at it. Yeah, uh, I'll try to answer the question as best I can. I think if I'm hearing it correctly, it's, it's more of, that's probably more of a broader question, even beyond just COVID, what I'm hearing. Um, and so, you know, in, in my work, you know, that's definitely um, – something want to do it. So I've, I've worked in, you know, nonprofit um, county now state employment. And so um, I've heavily seen the, the interaction between, you know, the different entities and how it needs to improve um, and, and involve the community. And so we definitely want to do a, a, a utilize the collaborative approach to this work. You know, um, the specifics of how that will work, we're still working on that, but definitely have spaces to go into the community, um, you know, whether it be going to a church or a community center, once things are opened up and we actually are able to do those things um, physically again, um, you know, obviously right now utilizing other resources such as Zoom or or um, web conferencing to do that work, but making spaces to be purposeful about going into the community, having discussions, you know, um, I think the term community is such a broad term. And so I envision community meeting a couple of different things, not just folks, obviously folks from, from the public sphere, you know, individuals, families, community agencies, 
but also engaging those of us who are from the community who also work in these spaces too. Um, the professionals, the people who work in these agencies and communities, the state agencies who know the community and also know the work too, and create more um, collaborative, you know, jointed spaces so we can actually have these discussions, um, hear the issues, hear the concerns, provide education and information, engage in dialogues that will actually be helpful to move the work forward, to be informed um, through data, both qualitative and quantitatively, to um, involve people and being very targeted about that, you know, involving youth, involving families, involving fathers, which you know fathers are involved in child welfare, uh, especially black fathers, so we see that. So really making purposeful efforts to do that work um, in a different way. You know, I think we have to bridge the gap between, um, you know, the state, you know, the counties and the communities and families and, and individuals. And as, as Dr. McKinney um, said earlier about the historical experiences in the medical field, but those same things also exist within child welfare too. We know that our community has been traumatized and been affected by many of the decisions and actions that have happened within the child welfare social services arena too. Um, and I think we need to acknowledge that, that that's happened um, and try to take steps to address that through really purposeful actions um, to make points to really include people. I, I, I find myself um, really utilizing my connections. You know, I think that we all have our networks that we use and I've been very purposeful in my, even my beginning work in my role to reach out to all the folks that I know who are in the community, who are from the community, who are working there, and, and set that foundation for that. Um, and people are, are really ready for that. You know, I think we haven't done a great job um, as a child welfare entity in terms of state doing that. Um, you know, and I think we also have to get a very comprehensive view and not just have one or two folks from the community represent us, so to speak, getting people that have different lenses, different experiences. You know, North Minneapolis, as we all know, is different than South Minneapolis. Um, you know, and then we have different communities that are in different areas, too. So we have pockets of us, uh, I mean, African Americans who are living in Brooklyn Center and Brooklyn Park and Woodbury and, and all those areas. And so really being purposefully engaged all these different community members um, to have these kind of conversations and dialogues on an ongoing basis and not just having it to discuss and just talk, but really be purposeful in listening um, and taking the information that we hear and using it to guide the work forward. And also, as we as a state involve ourselves in creating policies and practices, guidelines and things that move the work forward at a systemic level, doing the same thing, getting their feedback from the community and saying, does this make sense? What are we missing? How are we received? What can we improve on? Um, so being very inclusive, you know, and being purposely inclusive. Now will take some time. I know that we, we want things to come right away, um, but I also want to create a framework that can be sustainable too, that will be effective and sustainable um, going forward because I don't want you to create something that will just be done and we do it one time, then it doesn't work. You know, or it goes away. So it's something that can be a model that, that can be created. I tell folks all the time, and I mean this with all sincerity, that I think Minnesota has the capacity to be a national leader um, in, in so many ways, but I'm speaking more so on child welfare um, and how do we make it an equitable system. You know, if we have an equitable child welfare system that really does what we can do, then it would help alleviate some of the things that we see on the back end in terms of the outcomes that are negative, disparity, um, disproportionality that we see. Um, as the outcome of our work. Um, and then really getting to those root causes. So really getting into, like you know, was mentioned, you know, those social determinants of child welfare. We know that people are coming into child welfare through a variety of reasons. Public health is a big reason. Uh, we know that financial is a big reason. Social economics is a reason. So really getting to how do we work collaboratively across the state and inter intra agency interagency wide to really pull the other partners to address these issues as well. Um, pulling in D, pulling in Department of Health, pulling in education, to address those issues, then again, bring them to the community to have those discussions too. So um, that's my short answer, obviously. Um, you know, how we would do that will take some time. And again, how we do that, I want the community to craft that work, how it will work as well. So instead of me saying, hey, community, we're gonna come in and do this, ask them, what can we do to come in and support you guys and really engage you guys, that makes sense. So I think we'll be doing a lot of that work going forward. Uh, no, I think, I know we're doing that work going forward. Uh, and I know that if we do that work, we can really create some really meaningful and transformative change within child welfare. So hopefully that answers the question at a broader yeah. sense. That, that, that answers the question. And I think the beauty about the group that you have, have formed is that they are a working group. And so it's not just sitting around a table talking. Sitting around a table talking is that that's important to, uh, but action is very important at this time. Um, to be popular, to, to be selected to sit around a table and talk, that might be all nice um, and, and feed the ego of the people who are there. But sometimes we have to be humble 
and get on the ground level and do the work. And I, I'm a part of uh, your group um, who is looking at COVID-19 and really getting on the ground level and doing some work. I like the group because it speaks from the community aspects and uh, it has different parts to it, whether we're children and family services, children are our future. And so if you're not sitting there talking about how COVID-19 is impacting the children that live in these homes, then you're missing that piece. And African-American children specifically, you're missing that piece. I also like to highlight and, and, and lift up African-American males because they Oftentimes, they are the victims of uh, violent crimes from police and others, and they're stigmatized. They are a perceived threat. And so sit them at the table. I want to hear what my brothers have to say. I, I really do. And so when you don't see them at the table or you're on, on, in all white spaces, you can say, hey, I know some other people that can join us to add to, to the work that we're doing. And so I, I, I appreciate Devin for calling that group together and really calling voices that are sometimes overlooked and they're not the most popular voices and the voices and the, the images that may be seen as a perceived threat. Devin, put them at the center and say, what can we do in this community focused on the children and families in this community that can, that can go towards eradicating racism and also eradicating um, disparities and also uh, COVID-19. So uh, thank you so much, Devin, for, for your input on that. The next question I have is for uh, Dr. Karen McKinney here at DHS. Um, and I want to ask a question. Um, you talked about what DHS is doing to become anti-racist in their approach. And uh, also, we had another question from the audience with regards to that, because the person said they're a social worker. They've been dealing with DHS for quite a long time. They've spoken about ant uh, being uh, anti-racism, racist or diversity and inclusion before. But what is specifically is DHS doing in the community of employees that will shift the focus to more being a more diverse an inclusive environment. Um, I think I hit on some of that last time when I spoke and I talked about what 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 I'm doing and what um, at least some of what I'm doing um, and some of what DHS is doing. Um, and dealing with, with these laws and, um, and starting with this anti-racism strategic leadership team. Um, DHS, well, we've already started with uh, anti-racism training with the, the, the SST team um, leaders. And so for the last three months, since I've been home every month, they're getting a, a training on anti-racism. And this was new for them. Um, DHS, I found out when um, well, Castile, Philando Castile died, that DHS didn't have a response. There was not a response from the leadership. Um, the CFS administration responded, but all of DHS didn't. And, and that I was told that they kind of didn't talk about that stuff. I said, well, we're not doing that anymore. And I encourage the commissioner, you need to make your next video about what's going on with George Floyd. And you need to make a statement. And I'm going to make a statement. And, and so we are responding to these kinds of things because this is about changing culture of DHS. Um, and, and it's like, we're, not, we're no longer going to be quiet. Um, you talked about that earlier. We are going to speak. And even if people are not used to having these kinds of conversations, well, then you're going to have to learn how to get used to it. Um, because you can't change culture without um, changing people. And we can't do that without you looking, you know, you stepping out of your place of comfort. Um, there's a comfort zone and there's a risk zone and there's the danger zone. 
So I'm not saying we're going to go into the danger zone, but we're going to go into the risk zone. So for some people, it's very risky to try to have these kinds of conversations. But people are going, leaders are going to be, um, get training um, and encouragement so that they can move out of their comfort zones and start taking the risk to start having these kinds of conversations with their, with all employees. Um, and then employees are going to be asked the same thing. It's, you don't get to be silent. Um, silence says something to us. Um, it says something to all people of color. When, you, when you've come from the dominant group and, and then you don't respond to something that's happening to those of us who are not in the dominant group, um, Part of what we interpret that to mean is you go along with this, whether you do or not. Your silence to us means, OK, you, you're not saying anything. Does this mean you just like what happened? You just go along with this? And, and, and we don't know. So you don't get to stay silent anymore. Um, and, and that means you might have to learn. So part of that, that question that I wanted to answer was, what can you as an employee do? about, um, about uh, anti-racism and how can you help shift this culture? Um, I'm gonna say something that might be hard to hear. Um, what we as black people are, is we are experts at being victims of racism. We are experts at being targeted. But that does not mean that we excel at being anti-racist. Okay, so in order to do that, what we have to do is, is we have to educate ourselves and we have to learn. I had written an answer here. Let me find what I wrote. Um, so do we, can we communicate um, the intricacies of how racism works at the individual level, the cultural level, the institutional level? So if we can't communicate that, um, then we need to become, we need to work on doing that ourselves. Um, can we identify aversive, aversive racism? Um, and if we can't do that, um, then we need, to, we need to work on our skills at being able to do that. Um, when it happens to you, we, we need to be able to um, say, this is what's happening. It's happening to me right now. Um, I know as a, as a Minnesota resident, I have learned to stuff that because it happens so frequently. And I have learned to just let it roll off, but we still need to be able to identify it. Um, can you pull up examples of racial microaggressions and differentiate between when it is an assault, when it is an insult, and when it is an invalidation? Because we need to be able to do that. Um, because when we have these kinds of conversations, we need to be able to say something to people. So even though this happens to us, we need to have the language and we need to have the capacity to, to communicate. And we have to reflect. You have to think about racism and what's going on and how it impacts. Um, all of us have been socialized in this racial, race, racialized society um, to be racist. So um, for us, black people, it means that we have been socialized to hate black people. And we have been socialized to fear blackness. So we have to re-socialize ourselves. Some of us, our parents have resisted this from the onset. So in those families, um, it might not be so hard because this is something that, that, um, that, that, that you have done in your families. But in some families, we didn't do that. And so um, we have internalized this stuff and we have, to, um, we have to recognize how we have internalized ideologies that that don't, um, that are not for us, that tear us down, that make us think that we are less than. We internalize those voices. And I remember um, wishing that I was a boy and not a girl because in my society, um, boys were the favored ones. And I'm like, I wish, I, I wanna be, be a boy. Boys can run faster and they can fight harder and they can do better. And I'm like, okay, it took me a long time to recognize those were voices coming from outside and that that was not true. And it took me till I was um, an, a, a young adult in college before I really embraced and loved being a female, being a woman, being a girl. Um, and I had to silence all those negative voices that were telling me boys are better because boys are not better. 
in the same way we have to silence the voices that are telling us, you know, hate, hate blackness, be afraid of blackness and all of that, because those are real and those are everyday and those are out there. Um, and we have to learn, have different ideologies, ones that, um, that resist those kinds of things. And we have to practice this in our home and we have to practice this with our kids. Um, and we have to listen to the voices that affirm us and that see our value and our worth and, and that celebrate us as black people. I have, I have tons of nieces and nephews and, and when they watch stuff on the screen, because that's how it comes in our houses and they watch screens all the time. Average elementary kids are in front of a screen six and a half hours a day. And that was before COVID-19 and now it's even more. So, and high school kids are in front of screens on average 11 and a half hours a day. This is a day. So they're taking in all kinds of stuff that is giving them negative um, messages about their race, um, about who they are. So we have to um, learn how to um, embrace an anti-racist identity ourselves. And then, as it and, and then we have to teach it to our kids. As it relates to our work, we have to create, if we have to develop an anti-racist lens so that we can become experts and excel at applying the anti-racist lens to what we do at DHS. This is how we can, um, can, can start improving ourselves. So that means we have to educate ourselves. And that might mean we need to read some books. We need to watch some, some videos and listen to some podcasts. All of that stuff is going to make us better at what we do. Uh, people will turn to us with the expectation, okay, you know how to, you know how to apply this anti-racist lens. And we might be, oh, I don't know how to do it. It's like, okay, but, but, but this is something you can learn. Every one of us at DHS need to be able to do this um, because uh, they don't know how to do it. Uh, and so they're gonna be looking our way. And so we can arm ourselves so that we are ready. And so as we get into this transformed culture, um, we, we're all transforming. This is not just a journey for, for non-white people. This is a journey for all people, um, all of us. Doesn't matter what color we are. We, we have to be on this kind of a journey. I'll stop there. I agree. That, that, that is awesome. And that's right on point. Uh, right on point. It's all of our work. And we have to come at it through different perspectives. We have to come at it through whether we're African American, Black, whatever our ethnicity and race is. This is for us uh, as a people, and we need to come at it. But we also need to specify it's okay to, to target and focus and, and look at priority populations. That's okay. And sometimes we need to do that in order for people to be serviced in those focused populations. Uh, I'm going to throw it uh, over to um, Dr. the other Dr. and Kenny, uh, and it kind of blends in with this whole notion of social justice. And, and Karen talked a little bit about it, but how can can we continue to be safe with respect to this pandemic while pursuing social justice efforts at this present time? So it's kind of a twofold question here. Sure, thank you for that question. Um, if you don't mind, I'd actually like to respond to some items mentioned by the other Dr. McKinney and, and Mr. Gilchrist and even Ms. Hiller. I mean, uh, she's just, first of all, Dr. McKinney, thank you for those comments. You said such great things like, I want. I feel like I wanna just respond to all of that. And I'll try to answer the question too, somewhere along the way here. But, uh, you know, one of the most important things I'm just gonna say is, you know, I, I think we all recognize to some degree, you know, all this messaging just that want, makes us wanna hate ourselves or hate our own, blackness and you know look black is beautiful and before anybody says well everybody's beautiful then I'll just say fine it's just like black lives matter well everybody matters but black lives also matter and black is also beautiful but suffice it to say you know when folks are looking to us for information I and everybody else on this panel we don't represent all black people I don't represent all doctors I don't represent all black doctors I think one of the ways I got plugged in here was through the Minnesota Association of African American Physicians so if you want to hear some other uh, black physician voices, that, that is a good place to look. The other thing that's important to acknowledge, uh, this was mentioned by uh, Mr. Gilchrist, which is, you know, we need to engage the community 
we are all privileged in a variety of ways. I, and we're all blind to the ways in which we are privileged. And, and similarly, the people who do not have that privilege, it's 100% obvious to them all the time. And so this is why we need to engage the community because I'm not aware of my own privilege as a man relative to what women experience getting paid less and being you know, treat, treated poorly. And similarly, others may not be uh, familiar with the way in which we're treated as, as African-Americans or black people in the community. How do we move this forward? Like Dr. McKinney said, you know, difficult conversations, which many of us on this side were fearful or scared or anxious to have before because I just didn't want to lose my job. I didn't want to, you know, have to, to go there and, and try to educate somebody when, again, I'm not even in some ways an expert on everything that they might want to know about. So I'll just tell everybody, look, please try to understand your own privilege and try to identify your blind spots and try to remember that every black person you've ever met has been traumatized in this way by their American experience every day of their life. What happened with Mr. Floyd a couple weeks ago is just another stark reminder of what we've seen every day forever. So if you want to do something individually, have these difficult conversations. I'll start there. Okay, now, to answer <laughs> Ms. Mitchell's question from a couple minutes ago, you know, what do we do to try to keep ourselves physically distanced while still pursue, pursuing social justice? Well, I don't know if folks actually saw, you know, uh, a lot of Doctors, nurses, uh, pharmacists, people in the healthcare community went out to the state capitol this past Saturday. Uh, there's an organization nationally that has local chapters, uh, White Coats for Black Lives, and they we were trying to to be out there have a silent protest and in respect for Mr. Floyd. And at this protest, we were all trying to do a very good job of being physically distanced at the same time, maintaining space between each other, everybody wearing masks. So uh, the simplest stuff is much like going, you know, out to the store and everywhere else, wear a mask to help protect everybody else. Uh, I would say, you know, just like everywhere else, you're going, you shouldn't be touching people. When I saw people hugging people, I'm like, I, I don't do it. Don't want to go there. Um, you know, honestly, wash your hands, sanitize as much as you can. Um, since some of the protests with Mr. Floyd's uh, death, Minnesota Department of Health has been recommending both protesters as well as first responders who have been involved in addressing some of the protests go out and potentially seek testing, asymptomatic testing. Uh, there was some disconnect between the Minnesota Department of Health and healthcare systems over the past week where Minnesota Department of Health made these recommendations and healthcare systems weren't exactly yet ready to do asymptomatic testing simply because availability of testing has been problematic since the beginning of the pandemic. Um, so I would say if you want to participate in social justice efforts, I strongly encourage that, but try to maintain the same uh, tenets of physical distancing that you're doing everywhere else. And if you feel like you can't really avoid exposure, then you may want to get tested and you may even want to pursue some degree of self-quarantining to make sure that you aren't going to these events and then spreading uh, this disease around the community, especially again, being most concerned about uh, the older folks in our community, but to some degree, the younger folks as well. Thank you. Thank you for, for just prepping us and, and also following up because uh, many of us went out to protest and um, we had masks on, but that physical distance was not there because it couldn't be because we all bunched up in a, in a group protesting. Uh, but I'm glad that they've opened up um, testing for not only people who are showing the signs of COVID-19, but those who have been at large gatherings. So uh, I do see that on certain websites that you can get tested if you've been in a large gathering such as a protest. Um, and that wasn't evident, I'm going to say a month ago. It was only those who were showing symptoms um, of COVID-19, you know, so I'm glad that that's opened up. Uh, Betty, before um, you talked about the different sites that were available, if we can go back to that information um, from the uh, Minnesota Department of Health, who's available to get testing? Do they have to pay for this testing? I know I'm, I'm out here in the verb. Uh, they, they, they charge it uh, out here. And so I'm going to drive into the city so I can get my test uh, done for free. Um, 
But what, who's doing the testing? Uh, what type of testing? Is it asymptomatic, symptomatic? You know, what, what, is, what does all that mean? Okay, first I'm going to just start to say free testing is important because we have so many people that are uninsured and underinsured. And we know that everybody need, needs to have access to this testing. So, yes, we have set up four testing sites this week, and they will be for the next three weeks. And um, you don't have to be symptomatic to be testing. This testing is for everybody. And I have to say, you said a few weeks ago, we were trying to get testing in the community and we couldn't get it in the community. We were saying uh, the African-American community needs testing because we know that we're being disproportionately affected. And so we were working on that. And then in the middle of that came George Floyd and the protest and more people being out. And, you know, I'm really proud to say that even in the time of COVID, this public health crisis of racism was even more important to people to come out and address than being worried about their own health with COVID. And I, for one, appreciate that from the Minnesota community. I, I just want to put that out there. But yes, and so now that we know that there are a lot of us that have been exposed, we're setting up more testing sites so that we can find out where the clusters are in the community. And so there are testing sites that have been set up at the Oxford Community Center, which is the Jimmy Lee to folks that live in St. Paul, Jimmy Lee Rec Center. They are testing today and tomorrow at Jimmy Lee from 12 to 6. And then Sabathony over in South Minneapolis. We know that the uh, protests were mostly over in South Minneapolis. And so we have two testing sites set up over there. Today and tomorrow at Sabathony Community Center. You can go there and get tested from 12 to 6. You can also go to Holy Trinity in South Minneapolis. And uh, you can get tested there on, they're testing on Tuesdays and Thursdays. Everyone else is testing on Tuesdays and Wednesdays. And the other place is New Salem in North Minneapolis. We've been trying to get some testing over at Lindell and Broadway to, um, let that community know how they're being infected and how the community spread is, is, is really huge. And so uh, now New Salem is a testing site for the next two days. And this will be repeated every Monday and Tuesday or, or Tuesday and Wednesday. I mean, every Tuesday and Wednesday or Tuesday and Thursday at Holy Trinity. That will be for the next three weeks. And so anyone can go get tested. You don't have to have insurance. You don't have to have money. You don't have to be symptomatic. Anyone in the community can be tested at these four sites in the next three weeks. Okay. What if, um, I'm getting a question here, and uh, and actually I'm going to ask if people would submit their last round of questions, but Betty, what if people want to volunteer to be testers? You know, um, it, it, does MDH take that volunteer list, or how will one volunteer to be a tester? Well, you know, we've been looking for testers, and we really wanted folks. We, we need all kinds of volunteers to help do this. It's, it's, a, it's a big undertaking. And so if you want to be a tester, if you could just uh, email me at betty.hiller at state.mn.us, I will put you in contact with the folks that are actually doing the testing. We've hired a vendor from out of state to come in and do the training for us and to help us do this testing. They've set up all the logistics around these four sites and uh, it's being done. We know that it's really important to get this done now with all the protests and stuff. And so do, like I said earlier, do expect the numbers of confirmed cases to go up. Don't be alarmed because we know that the more testing we get, the more confirmed cases we're gonna get. And right now, even though we have um, over 25 over 20,000 already confirmed cases, we know that there is a lot more than that in the community that have not been tested. And so this testing, this huge undertaking of testing in the next three weeks, really gonna show us where this virus is in our community, where the clusters are so that we can really start working at uh, alleviating that and having folks stay home and quarantine that are sick. And then, you know, once your quarantine is over, we'll know who can go back to work and who can't. And, the, and the, you asked what kind of testing. It is the swab testing in the nose. Okay. okay, thank you. Thank you. And Devin, this question comes to you as a child protection worker. 
person said as a child protection worker or having some background in child protection, when a family member or, or um, they said uh, the majority caretaker of the family, if they do have COVID or if they test positive, how will those kids stay in the home or will child protection remove the kids from the home um, and, and under what kind of removal? Is it um, uh, unfit parent or unfit custodial parent or what have you? Will those kids be removed from the home if their parents have COVID? Yeah, no, that's a that's a great question, and so we've definitely had numerous conversations about that point um, within our area. You know, that is definitely not the intent of child protection, um, and that's not the guidance we've given. We have definitely given some guidance to counties uh, and communities about how to look at other means um, to help families who maybe have a, a a primary caregiver who's infected by COVID and maybe is incapacitated um, through hospitalization or quarantine or worst case scenario, maybe um, falls victim and, and dies from it because it will happen in some cases. Um, and so we've given some guidance around how to help families find the support to within themselves as a unit in their community to find resources to um, prevent that from happening. So it is not our intent as a state agency to have these kids come to child protection through foster care because of COVID. Um, that, that's not what, what the system is designed to do. Uh, and that's not what we want to have to happen either. Um, and again, looking at kids from African American families that could potentially create an adverse effect, effect and impact as well. So one example of that is there's something called a DOPA, which is a delegation of parental authority. A DOPA is a formal arrangement that a parent can enter into with a family friend, a, a relative, anybody they're choosing to give that person temporary um, parental authority over a child. So if I am, am a mother or a father and I have become sick um, with COVID and I am now, um, you know, you need to be quarantined for two weeks in my local clinic or hospital, and I'm a single parent, I can reach out to my my brother or my my mother or father or a close family friend or somebody that I trust um, to be a temporary carrier with my, with my um, child or children and enter into a formal arrangement um, to do that so that gives them the authority to make decisions, um, you know, about the children's care. So it could be medical decisions, it could be um, educational decisions, et cetera, et cetera, until I'm able to be able to return to my full-time caregiver role um, and thus, you know, um, avoiding child protection and foster care. So we are working heavily with communities to spread that message, those resources, and also encouraging counties to do the same. Um, now parents can certainly choose to put their kid in voluntary foster care. That is their choice. Voluntary is voluntary. It's not meant to be long-term. Um, they could do that. That would potentially give some resources to a relative um, financially as well. And that is an option. Um, but again, we don't want to have children moved um, from homes and put into involuntary foster care. Um, uh, in child protection because their parents um, unfortunately contracts COVID and is in a place where they can't take care of their kids temporarily. So that is not our intent. And we are working um, diligently and hard to make sure that that message is conveyed to the community. Okay. Thank you. All this information is critically valuable. It has been informative, really. And we, we got to talking about COVID in the Black African American community, but we touched on some really under lining things that, um, that uh, all of our communities need to know. They need to know the history and they need to know how to interact with that history and, and historical trauma of the Black African American community in order to, to better serve that community. And we need to study up on our own history and see what, what part we play in this and what part we can play in this in building our community. I think that's, that's so vitally important. As we uh, get to closing our conversation today, I just want to throw it open for any lasting or closing thoughts from our panelists. I want to thank them, all of you. Thank you so much for even rescheduling this uh, this uh, forum. That was uh, very kind of you. And so I want to thank you on behalf of Children and Family Services Administration and the, the Minnesota Department of Human Services just thank you for really enlightening us today. We needed this information as workers. We don't get to step aside and say, hey, we have a pandemic going on, and this is how I want you to do your work you know, going forward with the pandemic. We don't have that privilege, and so we're learning on the fly. We're learning on the fly because we want to stay engaged in the community and do our diligence, our due diligence in our work. So I'm just going to open it up for our panelists to give any 
final or last thing, final thoughts, if you would like. Um, I just un unmuted the, the line there, so you can have any, you know, final thoughts, or parting thoughts to our audience. I'll go first. This is um, the other Dr. McKinney, the female one. Um, to people that are attending the town hall, I want to say thank you for coming. Um, I hope that you got something that you can use and that applies to you. I want you to, uh, I want to invite you to, to get on this journey of helping to transform um, DHS um, and, and recognize we all have work to do. Um, I want to just say, don't let COVID get you down. Um, this pandemic is not going to um, beat us. Um, the pandemic of racism is not going to beat us. We are resilient. Um, and, and, and hold on to that and live into that. Um, and I just want to thank the other panelists. Um, I learned from you too. Thank you. Okay, this is Betty, and I'll go next since it seems to be the females first. Uh, <laughs> I, too, would like to thank everybody that uh, attended this conference. I'd like to thank the panelists. I've learned a lot from you. It is important that we learn what each other are doing in our work so that we, we don't have to work in silos and that we can uh, all be on the same purpose. And lastly, I just want to talk about how COVID-19 has highlighted the health and equity suffered by African Americans because of the lack of access to health care, education, housing, criminal justice, and all of the other indicators of well-being that should be available to all the people in the state of Minnesota. We are dealing with two viruses right now. We're dealing with the pandemic and we're dealing with the virus of racism. And uh, there's not a vaccine for the pandemic yet, the COVID pandemic, but I would like to just throw out what I think is the vaccine for racism. I think we have to look at each other as human beings. And I think that love is the vaccine that will cure all of this because I just believe that the darkness can't hide the light. The, the light has to come through. And so I want to leave that as a positive thought that we can do this. We can do this, Minnesota. We can do this, America. And I'm, I'm going to leave it right there. Okay, thank you so much, Betty. Anybody else? We close. I just wanted to say also thank you to the other panelists. I, I learned quite a lot from uh, hearing everybody speak. And, you know, I know everyone thinks uh, physicians probably think they're very much hot shots, but, you know, I appreciate all the work that you guys are doing at DHS and CFS, uh, you know, to address even more the social determinants of what are affecting the health and welfare of our communities, even more than what I'm doing. So please know you are all very respected. Uh, and I'm okay with females first. I got three older sisters, so that's the story of my life. Uh, lastly, I'll just say, you know, uh, for everybody out in the community there, again, my name is Zeke McKinney. I'm easy to find uh, on Google. If you're looking for other black doctors, talk to the Minnesota Association of African American Physicians. Uh, I think we'd be more than happy, we, them, myself, to engage uh, the community, to engage others at DHS or MDH or, or other agencies who, who may want more medically oriented information and, and aren't sure where to get that from. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you. Devin, do you have any questions thoughts? Um, you know, I, I don't want to belabor the point, so I'll, I'll be brief. You know, I, I again thank everybody for participating and attending today, um, panelists and attendees. You know, I, I think, you know, like like Dr. McKinney said, um, the first Dr. McKinney, this is you know not going to beat us. You know, this is we'll get through this process. So it's going to be taxing and trying. Um, hasn't been easy, but we'll get through this. And I just really encourage folks to just stay the course. You know, use their resources. Um, as best they can, you know, keep themselves safe. Uh, we're not out of the woods yet, so you know, if you start to open things up um, publicly, it does not mean that we're necessarily any safer, per se. And so still make sure that you're taking those measures to protect yourselves and your families um, um, as you need to and, and use resources to get what you need as well. I think especially summertime. I'm just thinking about summertime and all these kids who are out of school um, and just the, the, the long summer that they're in for, you know. <laughs> Um, that we're going to be facing. And so for parents and for kids, and so just I encourage folks to stay the course um, and, and be, be positive. And we'll get to this at some point in time, um, eventually, and we'll come out the other end, uh, hopefully bigger and better. Okay, thank you so much. 
Well, that ends our uh, equity forum. And again, I want to thank the panelists, all four of you, for really enlightening us, giving us some tools and strategies to use as we go forward with serving the people of Minnesota and uh, other areas. I had people from Chicago tap into this. Uh, and one person from Chicago, one person from Philadelphia, thank you for tuning in today. And hopefully you can bring this back to your communities as well. So uh, thank you for your time and attention today. I thank all the panelists again today in the work that they do to better the community at large. This ends the CSS Equity Forum Virtual Town Hall on COVID-19's impact on Black African American communities. So I wanna thank you all for tuning in and uh, thank you for your time and attention and be well. Thank you.